Welcome back to Pat Bar LSAT Prep. In this video, we conclude our presentation of Section 2 of Prep Test 76. Question 19 presents a politician quoting union leaders' arguments that more multinational control of manufacturing means more jobs in nations with less worker protections and a decrease in workers' average salary. The politician argues that because these union leaders want salaries to be high due to their own interests, legislators should reject their argument. Your task, find the flaw in the politician's reasoning. We can eliminate two possibilities immediately. The politician does not, at least in anything we're given, presume anything about whether this is the union leader's only argument or whether it's a position held by all union leaders. Did you choose A? Go read it again, and you should see why it's wrong. A might have been correct, except it presumes the politician is trying to cast doubt on all of the viewpoints of all union members. How about B? Again, this may seem to make sense, except the subtle change in phrasing. The politician says a vested interest, which can be a political motivation, but it's not a requirement, and therefore not clearly discernible in terms of what we are given. Had you picked either A or B and moved on, you'd have missed that C is not only correct, it's exactly correct. The politician is treating the union leader's vested interest as the only reason needed to discredit their argument. It attacks the union leader's motives, and that is the flaw. Question 20 presents a professor telling us that the number of new chemistry majors is the same as it was 10 years ago, but the number of people earning chemistry degrees has dropped significantly despite better job prospects. You need to find the one answer that, if true, most explains that decline. To eliminate the incorrect answers in this case, find the key question. The key question, something has changed over the past 10 years. What specifically has changed? For example, we don't know if there are more unqualified students now than there were 10 years ago. Many? Probably. But this doesn't explain the change. The number of degrees earned in natural sciences altogether makes no difference either. True, it would show a change, but it doesn't explain anything specific to what has changed for our graduates. B is incorrect. C is wrong for the same reason as A. Many students probably are unsure of their choice of major, but we're not told how many compared to 10 years ago and it would not explain in and of itself why there's a change. Would D help? We are told in the passage that job prospects for those with chemistry degrees are better, which is a change, but it doesn't matter whether that keeps a precise pace with other science degrees. Maybe if there was an accompanying assumption of a difference in salaries or prestige or something, but there isn't. D is incorrect. The first hint that E is correct is its first three words, over the years. This directly tells us that something has changed over the years. If we presume to be true that first year chemistry is more methodical and therefore less interesting than it used to be, it could explain the decline, and E is the only one that can. Question 21 features a passage that we are told uses flawed reasoning that diseases brought by Australia's first humans could not have caused the mass extinctions of several other species because no one disease could have been transmitted to that many species. Your task, find the answer with the closest parallel to that flawed reasoning. While a logical reasoning problem, this one in particular tests your reading comprehension. Take a moment to read the passage again. This is a one therefore all flaw, postulating that one disease could not have done it, therefore all of them put together could not have done it. We are looking for this specific flaw. So let's eliminate. It can't be E, which does not contain any flaw. 
it is incorrect to say some people get no benefit from flu vaccines if it's true that their symptoms are reduced. There's no obvious flaw in A either. We're told here that high interest rates can hurt the economy, but probably not this time because they're not always harmful. We are not given sufficient data to find a flaw, never mind the parallel. Did you pick D? Remember the flaw. One cannot, therefore they all combined cannot. To say most recent art is not great, therefore this one piece of art cannot be great art is a flaw, but it's the opposite of what we're looking for. C parallels one cannot, therefore they all combined cannot perfectly, except it's not a flaw. If we presume its details correct, it makes perfect sense that our three people probably won't eat together and instead will go home. So again, it's the parallel flaw we're looking for. And if neither of two people is able to fix both doors and windows, it presumes one cannot, therefore all combined cannot. If one can fix the door and the other can fix the window, then combined they have done the job. And the job is to repair our apartment. B is correct. Question 22 includes a disclaimer included in emails by a tax preparer that any advice should not be construed as advocating for any violations of the tax code. The passage argues that the disclaimer is only intended to protect the company and could not if the company did in fact suggest something illegal. And so, therefore, the disclaimer serves no purpose. You are to find the assumption that allows the conclusion to be proper. This question has fooled a lot of people, so we'll mention again. According to the passage, the only possible purpose of the disclaimer would be to provide legal protection to the tax preparer, then argues that it has no purpose. It is a virtual certainty that some people will follow the advice in some emails. This doesn't take away the possibility that the disclaimer has a purpose. D is wrong. Some clients would try to do something illegal if they knew how, and this would be the one answer that tends to argue against the conclusion that the disclaimer serves no purpose. E is incorrect. So what if people ignore the disclaimer? Again, this still leaves a possible purpose intact. If, despite the disclaimer, the company then turns around and advocates the illegal anyway, then penalties are quite possible. This speaks to the law, not to the disclaimer. So, if the purpose of the disclaimer is, as in the passage, for the company's legal protection, and the company does nothing in the email that might beg for legal protection, that would be the assumption that allows the conclusion. A is correct. Question 23 will hit home for a lot of people. The passage suggests that, since trying to help married friends solve their relationship problems usually fails and often ends with resentment, the attempts are usually unjustified. You are tasked with finding the answer that most strongly supports that reasoning. We can eliminate three immediately. According to the passage, the attempts were aiming for the best consequences, they were trying to do the right thing, and they were well-intentioned. Since we're looking to support the conclusion that the attempts are unjustified, to say they're irrelevant would also be irrelevant to the conclusion. The only principle supporting the conclusion would be if success is the only result possible to justify an action. E is correct. Question 24 presents a saying that authors who write to give pleasure to their readers cannot impart to them the truth of the subject matter, then argues that the saying must be false. That, since a top-selling book could be taken to mean its readers got pleasure therefrom, the saying must therefore be at least partly not true. One of the answers is an assumption required by that conclusion. Here's another problem that requires careful attention to detail. It discusses something authors try to do, then equates that with what their works actually do in concluding that the saying is false. So, to find the assumption required by the argument, that is, the only one that collapses the argument if it isn't true, you must be certain that you're applying it to the correct argument. 
It's true, for instance, that people likely don't know in advance that reading something will give them pleasure. But if more sales equals more pleasure, and therefore less truth, it damages the conclusion that an author can do both. We need a required support. B is, oddly enough, the wrong answer that should point you to the correct one. Assuming the opposite, that an author intending to please will always achieve that goal, actually strengthens the conclusion that an author can intend to please and still impart the truth. C is simply irrelevant. The argument is over whether an author can be truthful, not whether people are concerned about it. The passage argues that a book's popularity should not be the determining factor of its truth. Therefore, assuming the opposite of E, that a book cannot be popular for reasons other than its ability to give pleasure, actually helps the argument. If D were false, that a book may please you anyway even if it wasn't the author's intent, that collapses any argument that it's your pleasure rather than the author's intent that affects the book's truthfulness. D is the correct response. Most of you will have gotten this one wrong. Frankly, so did we. When a problem goes back and forth between positives and negatives, that's difficult enough. Toss in subtle changes in phrasing that completely change what something means, and it's easy to get lost. Don't be afraid to mark a question and move on, coming back to it as time permits. Question 25 gives us the argument that most new TV programs produced by Wilkie and Wilkie will be canceled because most of their new programming last season was canceled and all of its new shows this season are police dramas, which haven't done well in recent years. You need to find the response that most strengthens this argument. This question is a good example of not reading into the equation more than you're given. For example, B is wrong. We are told that most of the company's new shows last season were canceled. So what if most of its shows were police dramas? We're not told how many of them were new. None of the most popular shows last season was a police drama. So what? Popular shows are canceled all the time. We don't know whether popularity factored into what overall was canceled last season. A doesn't make any difference. We're told that most of the company's new shows will be canceled this year, like most of their new shows last year. Whether there's more new shows being produced this year, or fewer, or the same, doesn't affect the argument. None of the shows not canceled last year was a police drama? Two problems with this one. Again, we're talking specifically about new shows. And we're told that most of the new programs this season are police dramas, but nothing about last season. However, if all of the company's shows that were canceled last year were police dramas, that most strongly supports the idea that this year will end the same way. D is correct. Question 26 argues that if a corporation gets funds by fraudulent means, the penalty levied should reflect any profits made by the corporation in using those funds. You are tasked with finding the closest match to the principle given in the presentation. The closest match will also deal with offsetting any profits, so only one answer is possible. Automobile maintenance, as presented, does not involve profits. Bringing a factory into compliance with pollution laws does not address any profits. Who earns the benefits from community service work is irrelevant. Whether an athlete is barred from future competition could imply that his or her earnings are already offset, that is, kept by the owner of the contract. Only E draws the direct parallel that someone earning something as the direct result of an improper or illegal act should be penalized in such a way that those profits are offset. This concludes Section 2 of Prep Test 76. In our next video, we will begin our presentation of Section 3.